Interdisciplinary not, is not only a title, it becomes day's work, commitment, connections, solutions to the enigma around this table. So it's 30 in a core group, and around it you can gather 300. And if you take those who are already in pension, it becomes 600. It's a very complicated undertaking, and it is not going to be, in, to be done in one day. However, if you have in your brain or thoughts or dreams or imagination, as we heard last, last night, you know that in the morning after you get up successfully with a whole community of scholars involved, eager, and at the same time contributing to this fascinating project. Look at the INCNC, and it is not by mistake that, that I turn my head this way. You put it this way. You have your own reasons. They don't, I won't argue. But it's, it is about faith. Facing the new emblem, the new symbol of LSEC, two units of the brain. In order to get into the brain, you use the smell, you use the hand. But according to what you taught me in many of your lectures, you start the lecture with the face. It's more understandable. It faces you, hits you at the first moment, and then you take the face outside and you know this is the type of the face that I met. I do not necessarily remember the name, not necessarily remember the qualities, not necessarily remember the tone of the voice up or down, but I remember the face, the ears, the nose, the structure of it. You taught me, many of you, ICNC members that became LSEC members. So you are going to enjoy face in the coming days. You know, it is a verse from four Proverbs saying, as in water face reflects face, face so the heart of man reflects man. What's the meaning of the verse? We'll see in a second. But you'll see hearts, people will come, some will be very moving moments, others will be moments of rational analysis, no discoveries. That's what you prepared for yourself as a festival. But faith come at the end of the event to be remembered from for years, as they are kept remembered for years. And that was the heart of uh, Miri Shlomo's work. If you want the introduction to ICNC and to ELSEC, it begins with faith. And the questions that he raised, and you know them, I would like to read with you in his question marks the introduction to research that was his and some of the future research that was stopped at once in the age of 66, of a leader, as I said in the funeral, of an educator, of a person who was involved in all facets of life. He lived maybe four times life of a normal human being, immigrant, an ole, Paratrooper, one who established a new unit, then serving in one medical school, another med medical school, School of Education, Department of Psychology, ending up in the core of the university life and making it to be the core of the university life. Those who live next to him, Miri, from youth, kids, from birth, know the power of a leader, and at the same time, the face of a father and a family, mem a family member that I suspect you are going to raise before I leave or after I leave. Either a neural network 
tricked solely or primarily by psychogenomic information? Is it a unique module or, as our data seem to suggest, it comprises of several local networks, one dealing with primary, with the face components, and the other with the holistic perception of face? What are the visual primitives that are necessary and sufficient to trigger such a network? What are its function, functional characteristics, characteristics? Is it a modulated by context, conceptual and or perceptual? Do faces attract attention reflectively? reflectively and one question brings to the other. And at the end, Shlomo says, all of the above are questions asked in my current research. In the future, I intend to examine the neural mechanisms involved in social communication based on faces. Such an expression, lip reading, I add body language as the verse says. As in water, face reflects face instead of mirror in the times of Proverbs, so the heart of man reflects men. It's about women and men that created this project that is in a vector of becoming a university project, and at the same time, it goes to the basics, to the face of the individual, to the heart of a man, to a person who was with us and who enjoyed a lot his leadership, unfortunately and fortunately, at the same time, becomes an icon. Good luck to you in your studies, work, deliberation, and future, future research. We depend on you. We know that you are going to be successful. Thank you very much. I would like to ask Shai Bentin, who cannot be mistaken as the son of Shlomo, to say a few words about his father. I'm shy, Shlomo's uh, firstborn. We're thinking of maybe speaking to you about postal prognosia or theory of mind or mirror neurons. Those are the things we spoke about and being interested, I always asking questions, especially when we went skiing together. But I guess I'm here to speak about him. Uh, if I have to describe my father, in, in a professional way, anyway. Um, I would say he was a dedicated man. He was dedicated to his research, dedicated to his students, very dedicated to them, and very dedicated to his family as well. Um, he was also, um, had this quality about him that um, he could get people talking. And just, you know, the last year has been a very eventful year for us. Um, I met his uh, broker in a bank in the United States, a typical American banker, the typecast of an American banker. And my father took him out to lunch. He knew about his family, his children, and it's not a very common thing. And it's very typical for him, and I think his students know about this. And it goes all the way also the other way around. I'm sure students and colleagues who worked with him closely, probably um, at certain times, 
knew a lot about my life and my sister's life and what was going on at the time because he was telling everyone about this. But let me tell you something we also know a lot about you because he would tell us about you as well. As a kid, um, my family life revolved around his work. Um, we moved from Cholon to Haifa because uh, he went to, for his uh, master's degree in the Technion. We moved from Haifa to Jerusalem because he did his doctorate. And then we moved to New Haven in Connecticut when he did his uh, post-doctorate uh, in Yale. Um, after that, every once in a while, he went to a sabbatical and was ever home at the time, took with him. And the last year, it was only my mother. Um, my father was always under pressure. Um, he had a grant to finish, an article to publish, the student's work to go, to go over with him, sometimes rewriting it. Um, I know from my own studies um, that many, many times teachers give the same lectures even for 10 years. Him, he always, before every class, he did his, work, he did his lecture again. It was not good enough. There was always something to fix. It wasn't good enough. It changed slide and presentations. We were always about. <laughs> um, I remember every year, he would, he would say, you know, he was under pressure and everything, he would say, next year I'm not going to take on a new student. And then next year he would come, and then we hear this new name, and we ask him, who's that guy? He said, oh, that's my new student. So and that, that was a never ending story. Well, those students now are continuing his work and through their own ideas as well, and continuing his legacy, and that makes us proud. Um, growing up with him, he was a very, um, well, I would say smart and intelligent and knowledgeable about many, many things. He knew about anatomy, music, books, wine. So he was very interesting to talk to and learn stuff from, and I was very proud of him, and I was... I went, I went to lectures in the university, you know, I don't remember when, and he was talking about split brains. And it was, a, I think it was an undergraduate class or something. And I, I took the stories from that class and I tell them to my friends and I tell them to my colleagues because they're interesting and people like to hear about them. And I was always proud that my father dealt with those things and was um, teaching about those. One of the perks of him being so busy, um, that he was always available. You know, uh, well, his students know about this. I mean, they can call him up at 2 o'clock in the morning through Skype or something, and he was there. And then in the morning, he was also there again to ask them questions back. They mentioned it in his blog, a lot of them, that they set up after he died. Um, for me, when I needed to speak to him, he was always there as well. And you go online, he's there, I would say, Abba, dead, on Messenger or Skype, and he would say, here I am. Then you could ask him questions and talk to him, he was always there. I still have his avatar on my Skype, um, but it's a very absent presence. Um, well, my family here can tell you also about his experiments. We participated in those experiments as a kid. I remember putting on this hat. Well, and when I was a kid, it, there wasn't even a hat. It was electro that you had to somehow glue to your head. And I would sit in this uh, soundproof room and see pictures of words or whatever. I would have to press a button. I remember I used, to, and I was a kid, so I, I, I was doing a test. So I would go out and ask how, how I did. I couldn't grasp the idea that, you know, there's no good or bad way to do it. Just... Um, there was one time he struck my hand and the electrodes and moved my fingers for some kind of an experiment that they did. I don't even know what for. And he would, you know, come home and he used to um, show us faces. So we can, you know, he did a lot of uh, face um, deception experiments. 
and ask our opinions about things. So we are very involved in our friends. A lot of the <laughs> cultural life in the family was around these exper experiments and work. Um, being a high-tech guy, me, myself, I would use uh, the word WYSIWYG. For you, for those of you who don't know what it means, it says that what you see is what you get. My dad was, what you see is what you get. Um, you could see on his face what he felt. If he was, you know, some grant didn't go through or an article didn't go through, then everything would be terrible and you could see it on his face and, you know, it, you could feel it in the house and if it was the other way around, everything was happy. And another thing which is true about him that he would speak his mind, sometimes not very tactful, but he would always say what he thinks. Um, he, I wouldn't say he took, um, I mean, he, he wouldn't get insulted by things, but he took things to heart. Um, and, he, and he took his work very seriously, too seriously. And we have this long running joke at home, and although it's a joke, it's a true event. My father, as I said, I'm a computer guy, so my father called me up from France and he started the conversation with a very serious vo the voice and he said, and I I'll say it in Hebrew first, Shai, Karason. I was thinking, okay, who died? You know, which Karason means a disaster happened. In Hebrew, the disaster, um, you know, probably means something terrible happened. So again, I was thinking, who died? Then he would go on and say something about his computer and malfunction, he couldn't say or couldn't load or something got deleted or whatever in his work. Uh, this is very lacking because he took the stuff so seriously. Um, when my mother asked me to speak at this event, um, and I went to mark it down in my calendar, I found that I already had the event marked down because my father had mentioned it to me and, uh, as an event honoring his work after he, he won the Israel Prize. Um, who would have thought that I would stand here and speak instead of him and speak in his memory instead? I know that he was very happy to receive this honor and I thank you all for coming. It's a, no one could continue this better than uh, Professor Leon Duell, who was uh, Shlomo's student and is now the, the head of the psychology department and a dedicated member of ELSEC and ICNC. To tell us about uh, using the, the brain to study cognition, the legacy of Shlomo Dente. So, uh, this is not going to be a, a eulogy. Um, I'm not going to speak at all about what a wonderful mentor Shlomo was and how he affected the lives of so many people. I think Shai was, really did a fantastic job of telling you about, about Shlomo. And in fact, so many of you have known Shlomo. Um, we are actually, um, we, we gathered here to celebrate, to celebrate for Shlomo. And I want to go along as if this is what we're doing, uh, to celebrate Shlomo's science. And Shlomo was a really fantastic scientist. And he, he was there at the, at the very, very critical moment in the development of, of neuroscience and especially of cognitive neuroscience. He was there actually at the inception and he was definitely one of the founders and central pillars of cognitive neuroscience, both in Israel um, and, and in the world. Um, and I want to, for those of you who are not um, in, in the field to explain in, in one second, what cognitive neuroscience is. There was, there was psychology and then there was cognitive psychology. Somewhere in the, in the mid-50s was formed this uh, discipline of cognitive psychology, trying to understand higher brain functions, higher mental functions. And then there was neuroscience. And then slowly, these two, uh, these two uh, disciplines came closer. 
And it's somewhere around uh, the late 70s, um, it was clear that a new discipline is emerging, uh, which was eventually called by uh, George Miller and Gazaniga cognitive neuroscience. And the idea about cognitive neuroscience is to understand the neural substrates of cognitive functions. That's one way of seeing it. The other way of seeing it is understanding cognitive functions via their expression in performance and in neural, pro in neural processes. And I think if you look at what Shlomo's work, it was a little bit more about the second notion of cognitive neuroscience than the first, but it's really hard to, to tell apart these two sides of cognitive neuroscience. Now, cognitive neuroscience started then, the, Shlomo was there, as, as I said, at the inception. Uh, there are two big meetings uh, of cognitive neuroscience, one which is now uh, celebrated as the cognitive neuroscience meeting, it's the one of the CNS, the Cognitive Neuroscience Society, and Shlomo was um, a devoted member of that too. But he also organized one of the first uh, ICON meetings in Jerusalem, actually, um, in the early 1990s. It's called ICON, the International Conference of Cognitive Neuroscience, and that was actually even before uh, the Cognitive Neuroscience Society started, started its meeting. So it was really, it was really there when this whole th concept started. Um, now, I want to, to uh, lead you through one of Shlomo's many, many lines of, of studies. It's a very personal selection of, of things that I would like to highlight. I apologize to the many students who are here who, whose work I'm not going to mention uh, because it's really a very biased personal uh, tour through one of the lines which, which I was involved with a little bit uh, and I think is, illustrates the way Shlomo systematically treated cognitive neuroscience. Um, Shlomo's main, um, main method was event-related potentials, which is um, a way in which you can extract stimulus or other event-related uh, uh, responses of the brain through, uh, through the EEG. So you measure, you measure the EEG through a set of electrodes, and then by, um, by averaging, you extract specific responses to either, uh, resp to either decisions or stimuli that the, patient, that the subject has have seen. And just to uh, explain how Shlomo was central to, to this uh, method, to this discipline, when in 2000, a group of uh, senior uh, ERPs, or uh, electrophysiologists, cognitive electrophysiologists, came together to decide on the standards of how you uh, do this research, how you publish this research, and so on. Shlomo was there at the at the forefront of, of this group, writing the guidelines of how to do these uh, things. Um, so again, Sloan did so many things that it's impossible to really review his work uh, in, in, this, uh, short, in this short time. Uh, I'm going to, me to, fa to focus mainly on face perception, although he did some very remarkable and very important work about reading that actually impacted the way reading is taught in schools in Israel, literacy and he's probably responsible for the fact that more kids can actually read. Um, it's also interesting to know that, and actually a little bit worrisome, that his very first article was about the fact that uh, neurosurgeons in the operating room inhale a, tiny bits of anesthetic uh, gases, and that actually affects their decision making. So be worried, uh, when, be warned when you go to, uh, well, God forbid, no. Okay, so that was his very first, uh, very first study. Uh, and I'm going to go to, again, to, as I said, to go to this face perception, which was the main uh, stay of his work in the last, uh, in the last uh, two decades. And it starts from, from this fact that, uh, as I think Professor Ben Sasson mentioned in his, in his words, you, you walk through an auditorium where you, uh, I was actually coming here, I met somebody who I last saw 30 years ago. We went together to the army. And I saw her face and I knew I knew I knew her. This is a true story, it happened this afternoon. But it happens to all of you if you go, this is a reunion uh, that happened a few months ago for my class uh, from school. And I went to this reunion and it was really a surrealistic uh, uh, experience because you see all these people and you know them, you know them. You know, the, it, so many years have passed, they've been grown uh, um, a little fatter, they lost their hair, they, they have wrinkles, but you know them in, in, on an instant. You may scratch your head to get their names, but you know them. And so there's something very special about the way we process faces, and that really intrigued Shlomo, to understand what it is that is so special about the way we treat faces when we meet them. And so 
in, in, the, in the early 1990s, he was uh, at Yale, and he was intrigued by the fact that when his colleagues over there, Greg McCarthy and Truett Allison, uh, measured from the, directly from the brain in patients who had electrodes uh, on their brain, they found very specific responses to faces in, in the regions of the inferior temporal cortex. And Shlomo went on to see whether he can actually get at this response non-invasively using EEG. And so he presented to, uh, to subjects uh, either faces or cars or scrambled images of these. And, um, he, and coming out of this was this paper co called Electrophysiological Studies of Face Perception in Humans. And I'll tell you, show you in, in a minute what the result was. But I want to mention this particular study uh, is exactly what you would call a seminal study. It has 1,200 citations at this, and, and counting at the moment, and I found out when I was preparing this talk that it's actually the most cited empirical paper in the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience. The Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience is the, I would say, the central uh, journal of, this, of the field, uh, the one that uh, belongs to the Society of Cognitive Neuroscience, and this is the most cited empirical paper in this, in this journal since, since it started. So it's really a seminal paper, and what was found in this paper was that um, these are, these are uh, a group of electrodes on the scalp, and if we concentrate on electrodes at the back of the head here, uh, and I'll zoom in, in we, we see that there is a response here, which I marked with red, which is a response to faces, and, in its, and it's much, much bigger than the response you would get to any object you would present to, to the subject. And Shlomo called this the N170, and he emphasized especially the fact that there is an N170 effect, which is the difference, the specificity of this response to faces. Now this is an interesting um, result in itself, but the, interesting, the more interesting thing is how Shlomo used it in the next 20 years to really uh, tease, a, tease apart what it is that this response shows and what it can tell us about, uh, about face perception. So this is the N170 response to faces, and I just want to highlight it again because we're going to see it in many, many slides, so you have to know to recognize it. Okay, it's this big peak over here. Looks like a very banal and small thing to see, but it's actually very, very powerful. Uh, for those of you interested in the neuroanatomy of it, uh, Shlomo surmised at the time that it's uh, coming from the occipital temporal sulcus. Maybe it has some contribution even from the, lat from the superior temporal sulcus. But I'm not going to say too much about the neuroanatomy of this response. I want to highlight this uh, paragraph from Shlomo's uh, work in 1989, actually, when he was still working on words, where he said, and I'll read it aloud, it's maybe hard to read from there, it should be emphasized, however, that statements about relationships between specific late components, this is not so late, but it still stands, and cognitive processes do not reveal anything about the link between cognitive processes and brain structures. Establishment of such a link requires knowledge about the anatomical sources of the scalp ERPs. Despite some recent progress, such knowledge is still unavailable, and I would say that today it's just a little more available, available more, more or less. Nevertheless, the sensitivity, and this is important, the sensitivity of endogenous components to psychological manipulations provides information not available in behavioral research, particularly when a reliable relationship is found between an ERP component and the cognitive process that is difficult to investigate using conventional performance measures. So in, Shlom in Shlomo's view, uh, which might have changed a little bit over the years, but his main theme was that ERPs, or the responses that we record from the brain, are interesting in, in investigating the brain, but we can use them simply as more rich performance. It's a measure, another measure of, of performance or behavior that we can use to actually tease apart cognitive processes. That's why I call this, this uh, lecture using the brain to study cognition, okay? So in some of his work, he also investigated the brain itself and its neural processes, but in many of the work, it's actually using this, this response as a behavior, a rich behavior, which allows us to get into processes which, is hard, which are hard to get it, to get it uh, other ways. Okay, so once we have this N170 response, we can ask ourselves, what is, what is the face? Now, what is the face for the brain? What is the face for this N170 response? And there are many kinds of faces. There are real faces, there are, there are illustrations, there are comics, there are, there are animal faces, these illusions or these schematic faces. What is a, what is a face? What is the face for this early perceptual response that we call N170? And so uh, the, the next experiment, 
Uh, and this seminal study had many, many experiments, and it, Shlomo had to be convinced if, if, before he actually published uh, the paper. And he presented the faces of animals, which have also this configuration of nose and, and two eyes, and, and hands and, and chairs. And the result was pretty clear. The response was big for faces, and what, sorry, it was much smaller for all the rest of the stimuli that were presented in this particular study. So it was pretty sensitive to faces, not to any animal face, but several years later, he found that actually apes, ape faces, behave more or less like, like, like uh, human faces for this re the N170 response. So the response is very sensitive to, to faces, responses to ape faces, or to, I would say altogether to primate faces, but not to anything that looks like a face. Okay, so what about schematic faces? We, we regularly see things like smileys, you know, schematic faces, they look very much like a face, they have eyes, they have noses, they have, uh, they have a mouth. Is it like some kind of a conceptual thing that we kind of uh, high level cognition, we know that the thing which has two eyes and a nose and a face is a face, so we say that it's a face, or does our, do our brains really recognize this as a face just as it recognizes any, any other face? So you already know what the, what the drill is. You, you present these uh, stimuli to subjects wearing helmets uh, with, with uh, electrodes, and the result is pretty clear. The response to, uh, to these smiley faces is very, very similar to the response to real faces. So schematic faces for our brains are, uh, look like faces, despite the fact that they lack many, many of the, of the surface features. Sometimes they're, they're very distorted, they're caricatured. Nevertheless, we respond to them just like we respond to faces. This is, this is really interesting, but it leads to a really uh, cool, one cool result, okay? Um, or maybe let me first uh, mention one, one, other, one, one other result. So we have a response to faces, but faces have many, many features. They have their contour, they have their eyes, they have their nose, they have their, their mouth. What is it in the face that makes it a face for, for our brains? And so we, we uh, regularly think that the eyes are very important when we see, face, when we see faces. And so, so maybe it's to the eyes, maybe it's to the nose, um, maybe it's to the mouth, maybe any part can elicit the N170, maybe any part, any physiognomic part is a part of the face. And so if we pre you present all these to the, to the subjects, the result, is, the result is that you get an N170 response, you get an N170 response to faces in red here, you get an N170 response to the other parts as well, in you know, the dotted lines here, but you get a much bigger response to, to eyes. So at least uh, at this, uh, this st stage, it looked like um, the N170 response is sensitive to physiognomic uh, information, which is the information in the face, like parts of the face, eyes, nose, mouth, and especially it's responsive, responsive to, face, to eyes, which is very consistent with the fact that when we see a face, the first thing we look at are the eyes. Okay, so it's a very salient part of the physiognomic uh, information that we have. Okay, and that leads to, uh, to uh, a very, what I think is a very cool uh, result. You look at these two dots. What are they? Hmm? They may be eyes. Yeah, they may be eyes. Um, they're definitely eyes when, when you draw a little mouth or when you draw this circle around it. Okay, they're definitely eyes, and what happens when we, I remove this? Now they're definitely eyes too, right? So the question is, is are all these very conceptual high-level uh, manipulations that we do because we know that these two eyes might belong to this smiley face, or is this really a low-level uh, uh, feature where, which uh, elicits this N170 response? That it's 170 milliseconds after you see it. So. Look, for instance, at this thing, which is less familiar to you. What does it look like? A bunch of electronic uh, devices, I guess. But then if you draw these on, and you take them off, now I'm sure they look to you much more like faces. Okay? So what happens at the level uh, the, that we're, invest we're probing with this uh, N170 response? So uh, Noam Sagiv uh, with, with, Shlomo, with Shlomo had this, did this very, very nice experiment where they presented two symbols. They could be either plus signs or tilts or, or little lines and so on in one block. So uh, a few minutes of these uh, signs on the, on the screen. 
And then they presented a second block in which they presented various smiley faces. And then they had a third block where, the, again, it was just like the first block, these uh, two, uh, two symbols uh, on the screen. And the question was, what, 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 is there going to be a difference between the response to these before you've seen the smiley faces and when you're not in a, in a talk about face perception? Yeah? Um, will there be a difference between these, the response to these and the response to these? And so this, this is, the, again, the, the experiment. The, the first block was these two signs. Then there was another block of, of smiley faces, then a block of signs again, and then a block of different objects. And in the control group, it was the same thing, only between those two signs, those two signs, they, they were objects rather than faces. Okay? And if you look first on the, on the black and red lines here, you see the response to objects and the response to faces in black and in red. And as we've seen before, we see a very nice N170 uh, effect. What happens now when we look at these, at these block one and block three signs? Okay, so this is the response to the two signs before we've see, you've seen the face. And this is the response to, this, to the two signs after you've seen the face. And it's clear that you get this N170 response simply by the fact that you've been induced to, th to see these two as eyes. Okay? In the control group, in the, on, the, on the contrary, there is no difference between before and after. They look quite the same. So here we have a very neat example of how this priming or this induction of the perception of these two little signs as eyes changes your perception at a very early uh, stage of processing of the information. It's not a high level thing, it's a low level thing, uh, and you, you induce this mechanism to see this as a face, as a real face. Okay, so that was, that was one, one stage which I think was, was a very uh, uh, nice demonstration of what you can do with this simple N170 response. And then the question is, what is this mechanism really doing when we perceive faces? One stage in the mid-stage here was to, to see whether the N170 response is about detection of faces, knowing that the face is in front of you, or recognition of who is the person who stands in front of you. And so um, to, to look at that, um, I was lucky to be there with, to, to do this with Shlomo. Uh, we presented faces of famous, of famous people. These are famous people. For those who are Israelis, you know all of them. For those who are not Israelis, you know some of them. Uh, they're people who, they're, fam they're familiar people to you. And these are just uh, faces, uh, random faces that we, we collected. And there is, I'll, I'll just go briefly through this. The response was, the, the result was that there was no difference between recognizable familiar faces and new faces. The response was, was just the same. So this, this response is very strong response to faces and to eyes, but it, it doesn't really care about whether you know the person or you don't know the person. This uh, leads to a series of, uh, of studies with, the patient, with subjects, actually not patients, who have congenital prosopagnosia. And prosopagnosia is a situation where you can detect a face, you know you see a face, but you can't tell whether this face is familiar to you or not. And you have to make the distinction between this situation and the situation where you meet somebody and you know that you know them, but you're in this embarrassing position where you know that you should know who this person is, but you don't remember the name or where you met the person and so on. This is something else. Here we're talking about you looking at somebody and having no idea that you've seen this person before, even though you've met this person many times. Okay? So this is prosopagnosia. It can be acquired by brain injury or it can be congenital. And Shlomo uh, was uh, giving a talk about his work about face perception at some, at some place. And somebody walked up to him after the, after the talk and said, well, I have prosopagnosia. I, I don't recognize faces. And Shlomo, the way he was, he, he took it very seriously. He said, well, come to the lab and we'll, and we'll test you. And this guy happened to have very, very serious prosopagnosia. He was otherwise completely normal. He was uh, an entrepreneur uh, doing um, uh, online video. Uh, he, he, was, uh, he was an officer in the, in the Israeli Navy. Very, very talented guy. Only he couldn't recognize faces. And he told us some fascinating stories about how he, um, he would walk on the... On the um, in the port with his peers in the navy, and if they all wore if they all wore their their hats the same way, he couldn't he couldn't recognize them. 
Or, I mean, maybe the most spectacular one was that he brought his, uh, his um, um, girlfriend to, 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 the, um, to, the, to the hairdresser and left her there and came back after a couple of hours to pick her up. And embarrassingly, he didn't know who, who, is, who he has to pick up because her, her hairdo has changed during the process. And he, so he sat in the, back, in the back of the shop with a newspaper waiting for her to, to approach him so that he can, uh, he can actually pick her up. So he had a very, very dense prosopognosia. And we, we tried uh, very hard to, uh, these are the details of this uh, subject, we, called, we call him YT. We tried very hard to see whether he has any other uh, perceptual difficulties. We, we tested him with every possible neuropsychological test that we could find. Morris here helped us with the several of these tests. Uh, and we devised some of our own, some of our own. for instance, we, uh, we tried to see whether we can trick him not to recognize some objects, for instance, if we covered part of them, masked them with these blotches. Uh, so I hope you can recognize these uh, objects over there. Um, he did fine, just as, just as any uh, other subject we tested. Uh, we tried with words. We tried to see whether he could read these words. He could read these words, no problem. Uh, we tried with objects of, that are uh, three, could be or couldn't be three-dimensionally. He had no problem uh, detecting which are possible and which are impossible. In short, we could find no perceptual, no other perceptual deficit in, in, this, in this subject. The only thing was that he was really, really bad at recognizing faces. We showed him, uh, we, we collected at the time over 1,000 uh, faces, some of them uh, familiar and something like 600 and something uh, familiar faces from the newspapers, from celebrities, politicians, and so on, and about uh, 500 or 600 uh, unfamiliar f faces. He could detect 24 out of the 670 uh, personalities that we presented to him, as opposed to uh, something like 350 that his mates in the same age, the same level of education could recognize. For instance, he couldn't recognize the president of Israel at the time, it was uh, Weizmann. Um, he couldn't recognize um, uh, the uh, news presenters uh, like Chaim Yavin and so on. He could recognize Ben Gurion because he had this big, uh, very uh, particular uh, hair. He could recognize Peres as well because he also has this particular way he, uh, he puts his hair up. Okay, so very, very few people, very, diffi very diffi uh, hard problem with uh, detecting, f with recognizing faces. Um, he, there, Shlomo um, suggested that we do this test that Dehan used at the time with patients with congenital, with acquired prosopagnosia. These patients are patients who had a stroke and now cannot recognize faces. But it turns out that if you ask them to uh, name, to read out, these, uh, these names, or if you ask them to say uh, if the name belongs to a politician or a media celebrity, it takes us, normal, normal people, uh, healthy people, it takes us longer to, to say, the, to say uh, whether it's a politician or a media celebrity if it's incongruent with the picture, even though the pictures are irrelevant to, to the task. Okay? It turns out that just seeing the, the, the face there interferes with our ability to say whether it's a politician or, or a media celebrity. And patients who had a stroke in our prosopognosic apparently have the same, the, same, uh, perf the same performance. They are interfered with the faces even though they can't name them. What happens with a guy like YT who has pro congenital prosopognosia? Well, Unsurprisingly, in retrospect, as they say, <laughs> um, it turns out that he has no, no influence from, from, the, from, the, from the face he's presented with, which may be not surprising because he's never had any recognition of these faces. Okay? So this just goes to show how deep this problem is. And the, but the next thing was, of course, to see how the N170 response looks in this person. Now, Remember that the N170 is, a, is a sensitive to physiognomic features, to, to eyes, to mouths, to, the, to faces in general. And this guy, YT, was perfect in saying, here's a face, here's a face, this is a chair, and this is not a face. So he was, he was perfect, and we expected totally that his N170 effect will be completely normal, just showing that he can detect faces and cannot detect, uh, and can tell them apart from objects. And we, uh, we did this with a control group, again with the same age. Here now the, the black line, uh, sorry about the legend, the black line is the object and the yellow is uh, for faces. 
And when we presented this to, to IT, we were really surprised to see that he had a very normal response to faces, but a, but a face-like response to objects. The difference, the difference between the response to faces and the response to object was much smaller, and significantly so, in YT than in, in the controls. So it's not an impairment so in the response to faces, but it's a response to objects which the brain, re the brain reacts to objects as if they were faces, so to speak. And for those who want to see the topographies, uh, we see here that this is uh, in controls and this is in YT, and you see that in controls you can easily see when the, say, when the subject is seeing a face versus seeing an object, whereas in YT it's much, much more similar. So it looks like the object elicits a response uh, which looks like this, you're seeing a face. And um, we also went on to do fMRI with this, with this subject, um, and we found out that, uh, for instance, uh, the responses in the FFA and in other regions which are responses to faces were completely normal as far as we could see these faces. I have to say that later, Galia Vidan has shown some interesting uh, results about connectivity uh, in, in, this, in the, these kinds of patients, but I'm not going to talk about it too, too much. The nice thing about this result, with the, the N170 results in YT, was that it was replicated again and again in more and more congenital prosopagnosic patients. And the patient that, Sh that Shlomo um, and I um, studied uh, at the time was only the third one ever, ever described. It was, the, I think, the purest one ever described at that time. But since then, it turns out that, more and more, that there are more people than we thought before that are prosopagnosic. And when they, when in all the cases when they were tested you, with this test, you find that here, for, but I have to, to apologize for the fact that some people actually present ERPs with a negative up rather than negative down. So this is flipped up. So this is the N170 now, and you see that in controls we have this N170 effect between faces and objects, but in this patient, SO, no effect. In this patient, GH, no effect. So again and again, it's the faces look normal. It's the objects that look like they behave like faces. And this is another one that Shlomo later uh, uh, studied in with his, uh, with his uh, colleagues in Berkeley, and the, the patient KW, and I just point, I'll point out just the top row here, showing that again, faces versus objects in control, and in KW, a response, very nice response to faces, but a response to objects which looks like faces. So this is a very typical response in congenital prosopognosic. So what's going on here? And this, this yielded a very interesting story in, 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 my, in my view. It looks, like, it looks like what happens in these patients, the reason that they might be de they have a deficiency in recognizing faces, is that they actually treat objects as if they were faces. To go to the, on the other side, it, normally it seems that when we see a face, there is a mechanism that detects, this, de detects the stimulus as a face and labels it. This is a face. Face go in this stream, this is how we're going to process this information, and objects go the other way, we're going to process it in another way. Because we, can, because we do that, we are able to really specialize in recognizing faces, because we have a mechanism which sees a face and another face and another face, and the, fa the statistics of the faces can be embedded in this mechanism. The faces can be stored in a very efficient way, because we have a mechanism dedicated to uh, putting down the statistics of faces and nothing else. Now, if you, if you don't have this mechanism that streams the information this way or the other, then what happens is this, this mechanism gets cluttered with information of various sorts, and it cannot specialize or learn how to deal specifically with faces to learn the statistics and to create good memories of faces. And so this, is, this became what Shlomo called the, stre the streaming hypothesis of, of, of face, uh, face processing. And uh, the, the assumption was, or is, that the N170 is a signal that shows us this streaming effect, this detection of faces as faces, which later leads to this, uh, this specialized processing. Um, this just uh, recapitulates what I, what I just said. And the last, re the last uh, result I'm going to show you is that Shlomo actually, um, heroically, I think, took this uh, stage further with Joe DeGottis in, in Berkeley. And they had, they had another uh, congenital prosopognosic patient, patient, and they decided they're going to treat her. 
they're going to, lead to, to teach her to recognize faces. And so um, they devised this, uh, this array of faces which they uh, synthesized from this special uh, program. And what's special about these faces is that they can vary either by the eyebrow height, so you can see that the higher uh, the faces are on this uh, dimension, the, the, the height of the eyebrows relative to the eyes is, is, is bigger. And on this dimension, it's the mouth height relative to the nose. Okay, so there are these two dimensions, and the, the patient was taught to categorize faces into L faces and R faces with this boundary between them. And so the patient came and hundreds of, every day and did hundreds of, and hundreds of, of these uh, tests, a new face every day, of course, so that they, they can't learn the specific exemplars. And there was a, uh, there was a very... Um, uh, intensive uh, training which took s several days and actually went on for months later and you can just you can see that before the training before the training the patient like all the patients that I described so far has this N174 faces and for objects which looks very much the same so again another patient showing the same the same uh, phenomena after training after training it turns out that the response to face even though the patient was trained with faces Nothing happened to the respond to faces. What happened was that now objects are treated differently. Now you get the N170 effect that you didn't get before. So something about training this configurable processing in, 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 in the faces allows you to do this face detection and streaming in a more efficient way. And it, uh, it's interesting to, to, to see that the patient with this training actually became much better at recognizing faces. So in formal, in formal tests before the training, this is, uh, this is the uh, words, we're, we're remembering words, and these tests over here, without going into the details, are different test, tests of face memory, where you see one face and you have to say later whether this, you've seen this face before or not. Um, so you see that the patient is way below the norms, okay? These gray lines are the norms. After training, the patient got much better in all these, uh, in all these tests. He's actually she's actually become uh, within the normal range. Even with famous faces, she's become a little bit better. But remember, this is a congenital prosopagnosic patient, so you don't expect her to get much better with famous faces because she's never had any exposure to them when she can recognize faces. So this, this uh, training both improves performance and sort of... Uh, um, relieves this deficit of having the same response to objects and to, and to faces. Um, she also said that subjectively she was doing much better in, in, in her interactions with, with, with people in rec recognizing faces. Um, so again, this is, this just, this is a, a remarkable th uh, um, case, I think, of showing how you can take this uh, response, which initially looks like, well, we found another ERP component, and you could walk it through a very clever uh, series of experiments, well devised and replicated, and show, first of all, what this mechanism might actually uh, indicate in cognitive, in cognitive terms, and then to take it through into the patient population. And Shlomo had several cases, very fascinating in different directions along his career, where he did uh, very, very impressive uh, work. Um, I'll finish by, by um, saying that it's really um, amazing and unfortunate and, and um, terrible that, that we lost Shlomo at this, uh, at, this, at this stage, at this stage, because he was, it, it's, it wouldn't be exaggerated to say that he was, at the, he was a young scientist, okay? He was, he was a young scientist in the, in the way he treated science, and Shai said it very well. He was um, dedicated and passionate and cared about, about everything in science. Nothing was, well, as they say. He cared about everything that anybody said about what he was doing. And also his productivity. This is a, this is a, um, um, a present that his students uh, prepared for, for him uh, a few months before the accident, when Shlomo won the, 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 the prize, the Israel prize, we had a, we had a party uh, at, at my place, and the, the Susan present, presented him with this with his, uh, image where all, all of us, his students, past and present, are uh, embedded in, the, in this picture. And this is, uh, 
And this is the number of publications per year, okay? And th this, is, this is the last year, and uh, I, count, I actually looked uh, a few days ago, and Shlomo is still publishing. Um, and he, the, the, number, the numbers are increasing every day. Uh, um, so um, it, it's, 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 it's really a shame, <laughs> what can I say? Um, for, for us, for us um, in, the, in, the, in, in both Shlomo's lab and in my lab, it, uh, I could speak for myself, but I think I will speak for, for everybody. It, it, it's, it feels as if Shlomo just didn't yet come back from his sabbatical, and we, we, we wait for him to, to come back. It's, it's, in, it's just impossible to, to think otherwise, um, because he was such a, an amazing uh, scientist and, and, and mentor and friend. Thank you.